me thank all of you for joining us today at, at lunch. Uh, my name is J John McConnell. I now work on the staff of Vice President Quayle. I became affiliated with the Federalist Society uh, while attending law school in a place called Left Haven, Connecticut. And uh, you know, watching uh, television this week, I think each of us, I, I know I have as a, a speechwriter, had a, had a sobering reminder that in the political slash legal world today, uh, no speech truly goes unnoticed. And no human utterance, it seems, is immune from mischaracterization by, say, the members of a Senate committee. Given that, I assume our speaker will not rush to offer praise of anything said by Lou Lehrman. <laughs> Lest he be challenged on it someday and perhaps be accused of in the inartful phrase of Senator Biden, an unartful dodge. Before, before uh, making the formal introduction of our speaker, let me just recognize some of the guests now seated at the, at the head table. Uh, first, the Honorable C. Borden Gray, the counsel to the President of the United States. <clears throat> The Honorable Gail Norton, the newly elected Republican Attorney General of the State of Colorado. <laughs> Professor Elizabeth Fox Genovese, one of our panelists yesterday. <laughs> and her husband, also Professor Eugene Genovese. <laughs> Professor Alan Farnsworth. And the Honorable Frank Easterbrook, United States Circuit Judge of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Crowd pleaser as always. <laughs> Our speaker today, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Peter Huber, a senior fellow of the Manhattan Institute, who also serves of counsel to Mayor Brown and Platt. He holds a degree in law from Harvard University and a PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. He clerked on the DC Circuit for Judge Ruth Ginsburg and on the Supreme Court for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Dr. Huber is the author of two magnificent books, uh, Liability, The Legal Revolution and Its Consequences, and Galileo's Revenge, Junk Science in the Courtroom. <laughs> he has written numerous articles, yes, more than two, Judge Bork, and has a column in Forbes magazine. It should also be mentioned that Dr. Huber travels widely, speaking to Federalist Society chapters and other groups all over the country. In the process of all this, our speaker has truly gained a superb reputation as someone who never abandons intellectual honesty, never shies away from debate, and never fails to impress his listeners. We are delighted to have him here with us today. Please welcome Dr. Peter Huber. What I like about the British is that they know how to have <clears throat> an interesting political scandal. Uh, we get Alan Cranston and banking, both of which are boring. Um, their scandals, for reasons never satisfactorily explained, always involve sex. Um, <clears throat> uh, here, for example, is a summary of the 1983 Parkinson scandal uh, from a splendid book, Inglesi, by the Italian uh, Beppe Severnini. Cecil Parkinson committed political suicide in the easiest way. He knocked up his secretary, Sarah Keyes, promised to divorce his wife to marry her, then changed his mind. On resigning, he made the following comment, uh, the deeper meaning of which was not fully grasped by many people at the time. Uh, I quote, it's no use, I can't go on, you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube. <laughs> Now, I can see that had I been standing in uh, Mr. Parkinson's shoes, I would have uh, racked my brains to come up with some different metaphor, but no, uh, no matter. Um, the, the homely image of tubes and toothpaste, I think, is a, a useful one for present purposes for anyone grappling with the larger issues of individual 
responsibility. This is one, perhaps the only remaining issue that almost uh, everyone will agree on. It's your tube, you squeeze it. What follows is your responsibility. Uh, or, or is it? Um, let us visit with Darlene Norris and Wendy Gatz, who are attending a rally of the Blue Knights Motorcycle Club in China Hot Springs in Alaska. Um, as they are driving out of the parking lot, Gatz in her Audi 5000 suddenly accelerates at tremendous speed, swerves wildly, careens around the lot, runs over Norris, who is riding her motorcycle, uh, hits a, bound, a mound of dirt, and is finally stopped only when uh, she collides with a large pile of wood. Uh, Darlene Norris, the main victim of this demolition derby, survives, but uh, her bills total some $300,000. Uh, now, some of you with technical backgrounds know uh, what it is that makes a car uh, accelerate. Uh, it's the accelerator. Uh, <laughs> it's your pedal, you squeeze it. Then ecstasy, disaster, whatever, much like Mr. Cecil Parkinson. This, in fact, is precisely how Norris uh, the victim sees the matter after this accident. She sues Gatz, demands compensation for her very considerable injuries. And what happens? Uh, Gatz brings in her defense uh, the views of a certain William Rosenbluth, an expert witness. Rosenbluth uh, testifies that Gatz, uh, the driver of the car, is blameless. Responsibility for the accident is to be found in Bavaria. It lies with the car, the Audi 5000, not with Gatz's fat foot. Uh, the car, testifies Rosenbluth, had accelerated uncontrollably. Gatz had indeed been standing on the brake the whole time. The brakes had unaccountably failed. Granted, both the accelerator and the brake were both found to be in perfect working order after the accident, uh, but no matter. Who's responsible for the accident? Nobody in Alaska, only people who live in Germany. The jury buys this story beginning to end. Gatz doesn't pay a cent. In fact, Norris, the plaintiff, is ordered to pay. Rosenbluth's $18,000 in expert witness fees. Uh, for a period uh, of years in the 1980s, uh, these Audi stories become remarkably common uh, in our courts across the country. Harold Horowitz manages to crash his Audi through a brick wall and into the apartment of Jermaine Gibbs. They both blame Bavaria, and Gibbs collects a substantial judgment. Alice Weinstein crashes her Audi into a tree and breaks her nose. Uh, she is not wearing a seat belt. She files a total of five lawsuits in state and federal court demanding billions in injuries. Another driver manages to hit almost every single car in a line at a bank teller machine. Uh, such, uh, <clears throat> such, such stories accumulate. Uh, the Audi seems to be possessed by demons. It runs through garage doors, it crashes through storefronts, it leaps into swimming pools, it shoots down elevator shafts, and every time, I mean every time, the terrified driver is standing on the brakes, but the car is just unstoppable. Uh, <laughs> Alice Weinstein found something called the Audi Victims Network. Um, Clarence Ditlow of the Center for Auto Safety, a Ralph Nader spin-off, uh, takes up the cause, uh, he blames an electronic glitch in the car's computer, apparently activated by stray radio signals. Um, uh, the cases accumulate. Now, uh, I shall return to the Audi shortly and stories of similar character. Uh, but before I do, let me <clears throat> say a few general words about what can only be called junk science. Uh, what is it? It is through the looking glass science. It is a mirror image of science itself. It is astrology, not astronomy. It is alchemy, not chemistry. It is homeopathy, not pharmacology. It is clinical ecology, not immunology. It is chiropractice, not physical therapy. It is numerology, not mathematics. Junk science, and there's lots of it around, is a hodgepodge of fudge tests, concocted correlations, biased data, spurious inference, and logical ledger domain. Uh, all patched together by researchers whose enthusiasm <clears throat> for discovery and diagnosis uh, far outstrips their skill. For those of you interested in reading more on the subject, I commend to you a splendid new book called How We Know What Isn't So by Thomas Gilovich and another uh, equally splendid book um, called Galileo's Revenge. Um, <clears throat> uh, let there be no mistake about it, there is a great deal, a large volume of this stuff uh, out there. Now, so what? Um, junk, after all, is not entirely novel uh, or unknown commodity on these shores. Uh, we have survived junk food. We will no doubt survive junk bonds. We have survived the National Enquirer. Um, generally, a, a, a free and robust society somehow manages to accommodate the good and the bad. Certainly, the scientific community has 
recognized and acknowledged the problem of bad science for as long as there has been a scientific community. And mainstream science responds with tests and repetition and verification and the development of consensus. And that process over time, given time, has proved remarkably robust at filtering out uh, things that are so from things that aren't. But this process does always take time. And a question of some importance is how a society like ours deals with speculative far out claims before the machinery of science has had a chance to really grind them down and deal with them. In recent years, junk science has made tremendous advances in the one arena where it can have real power, and that is in the arena of government, most particularly in the arena of our courts. In many, in many of our courts in recent years have drifted toward what Judge Patrick Higginbotham terms the let it all in philosophy of expert testimony and scientific uh, evidence. As Donald Elliott of Yale has said, many of our courts today extend equal dignity uh, to the opinions of charlatans and Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the dilapidation of science in court has created tremendous new opportunity to shift responsibility from here to there and from me to you and vice versa with gay abandon. If you are at an age as I am where you watch rather more of Sesame Street than you, you might have in years past, uh, you perhaps uh, know this song. Someone with a voice which I find to be uncannily like Madonna's uh, exhorts my three-year-old uh, to eat her cereal and belts out the lines which I should sing, but I don't quite have the guts. Uh, they, they run like this. Uh, I said, I'll taste it, I'll give it a whirl, because I am a serial girl. Um, this is uh, Sesame Street. Um, this, it's, it seems to me, uh, rather captures uh, the spirit of much uh, junk science litigation today. Something has gone wrong with your digestion or otherwise in your life. Um, uh, someone out there draped in some mantle of authority or expertise or notoriety is prepared to say that someone else perhaps in Bavaria, is to blame. Uh, you can come to court, you give your theory a whirl, uh, and sooner or later, if you do this often enough, you see the serial girl part, uh, the repeat litigator stands an unreasonably good chance of becoming something quite different and being materially rewarded uh, quite generously. It is certainly beyond dispute today that uh, our law libraries across the country are packed, quite literally packed with claims that the mainstream scientific community considers to be pure and utter fantasy. An impact with a car steering wheel causes lung cancer. Breast cancer is caused by a slip and fall from a streetcar, uh, by another fall in a grocery store. Uh, breast cancer is caused by an exploding hot water heater, uh, by a bump from a can of orange juice or an umbrella handle. A morning sickness drug is blamed for thousands uh, of birth defects. A huge litigation industry revolves around the junk science of clinical ecology, a body of pathetic, neurotic ignorance, uh, which maintains that uh, diffuse environmental pollutants cause something uh, with the inflammatory name of chemically induced AIDS. Uh, scientifically speaking, um, these stories are worthy of the National Enquirer, where in fact some of them uh, originated, and yet they are announced uh, not in smudgy, badly typed cult newsletters, but in calf-bound case reports. They are endorsed not by starry-robed astrologers, but by black-robed judges. Uh, they are subscribed to not only by quacks, just a few steps ahead of the authorities, but by the authorities themselves. The, ca the cancer by streetcar cases are decades old, but the others that I have mentioned are, 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 are recent. Junk science in court has become a powerful instrument for externalizing individual problems and shifting responsibility far afield. Become a victim, blame someone else. There's an expert witness out there, if you look far enough, who will certify your victimhood and link, link it to something diabolical and distant. And then six or 12 stout citizens, rounded up at random, will be called upon to vote. Do you always win such claims? Of course not. In fact, most of them are won by the defense. But what you get is a chance to win, and you get it with alarming frequency. A clever cover designer for, recent, for, for Reason Magazine uh, recently called this game a spiel of fortune. Um, a truly fundamental problem for many of our brothers and sisters in law, is that what science tells us about individual responsibility is sharply different from what a great many lawyers and litigants would like the facts to be. If we hewed to serious, solid science in our courts today, we would shut down a very substantial fraction of our litigation industry. What does good science really tell us about many of life's troubles and afflictions? 
Good science tells us that the asbestos mess, which is surely the mother of all messes in our legal system today, the asbestos mess is in fact at least two-thirds not an asbestos mess but a tobacco mess. Good science tells us that for all practical purposes, defects in car design are irrelevant whenever you find either alcohol or unbuckled seat belts on the scene as you do in most accidents. Good science tells us that chemically induced AIDS is indeed a very real affliction. It is a psychiatric affliction compounded and inflated by litigation. A, systi a systematic study of 50 consecutive clinical ecology patients found that 43 were pressing workers' compensation claims and one was involved in child custody litigation. Good science confirms that overwhelmingly the most important known causes of birth defects are causes, insofar as we know them at all, within the individual's control, alcohol, tobacco, drugs more recreational still, and yet the most lucrative and largest growth area in, the in medical malpractice liability litigation today involves blaming who, uh, people who deliver babies for birth defects. And what finally does good science tell us about sudden acceleration in the Audi? What it confirms beyond any serious possibility of doubt is that the Audi, like other cars, accelerates suddenly when people put their foot on the accelerator. There was nothing wrong with the Audi's electronics. The brakes never failed. The crisis beginning to end, and it lasted quite a few years, was a pure creation of lawyers and the mass media. Why then did the accidents happen more often in the Audi, you may wonder? They didn't. By pure fluke, the Audi got swept up in publicity and a lawyer's smear campaign. Once 60 Minutes gave people an attractive external target on which to blame their accidents, the temptation was too good, too strong to resist. Indeed, the only perfect, unambiguous correlation in the entire Audi affair was that after the stories aired on television, more people reported sudden acceleration incidents. We actually have something of a scientific test of this. You know the Canadians always like to be slightly different from their cousins to the south. It sort of reaffirms their sense of uh, individuality. And their television decided that, in fact, the sudden acceleration problem belonged not to the Audi, but to Honda Accords. Each, each time they ran a story, they got a raft of complaints that the Honda Accord uh, was subject to the same uh, diabolical defect. If you, in fact, if you dig through NHTSA files uh, here in Washington, you will find virtually identical charges raised against not only Hondas, but GMJ cars, Fords, Buick LeSabres, Oldsmobiles, Pontiacs, and Mercedes. At one time or another, over 10 million cars owned by highly competent, I'm sure, and utterly blameless drivers had been fingered as suffering from sudden acceleration defects. P.J. O'Rourke, author of a truly magnificent new bestseller, Parliament of Whores, uh, wrote the best summation of the Audi scam in an article modestly titled, The Sudden Acceleration Media Hack and Liability Lawyer's Bottom Feeder Tournament. Um, <laughs> s -s Sudden acceleration, writes O'Rourke, is a mysterious phenomenon in which a short, silly, middle-aged driver with a lawyer gets into an Audi 5000 and all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, goes through the back wall of a garage and onto the CBS 60 Minutes television program. <laughs> Let us visit uh, with Mr. Cecil Parkinson once again, or at least with a story much like his. Uh, this is Cecil Parkinson as revised by American lawyers. It is 1942, we are in Hollywood, and a young woman named Joan Barry is having a torrid affair with a famous movie star named Charlie Chaplin. Sometime in December 1942, she becomes pregnant. Shortly, there, uh, shortly thereafter, she demands that Chaplin pay child support for her new daughter. There follows a scandalous trial. Barry claims that she slept with Chaplin on December 10th, 23rd, 24th, and 30th, the festive season indeed. Chaplin is required to parade in front of the jury uh, beside Joan and her infant child so that the jury can compare features and uh, uh, make their own assessment. Chaplin's butler is interviewed at length. Um, Chaplin, however, has a defense. He, it emerges that in November and again the following January and April, uh, Joan had traveled to Tulsa and, Oklahoma, uh, and had been wined and dined by another gentleman. She had yet another friend uh, in Los Angeles and she had told the butler that she was going to marry an army captain and bear his child. So there was one might concede a certain confusion in the evidence. The jurors retire, they take a vote, uh, they decide that the little tramp, um, 
I'm referring to Chaplin, of course, is, is responsible. <laughs> uh, 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 Chaplin is responsible and must, uh, must pay. A California uh, appellate court affirms. Curiously, one appellate judge files an indignant and unavailing dissent. I quote, uh, time was when the courts could rely upon human testimony, writes uh, Judge McComb. But modern science brought new aids. If the courts do not utilize these unimpeachable methods for acquiring accurate knowledge of pertinent facts, there will be great miscarriages of justice. What exactly did McComb have in mind? He had in mind a 1901 discovery by a scientist called Landsteiner, the discovery of blood typing. Uh, blood types are genetically determined. The A and B antigens don't occur in a child if they don't occur in at least one of the parents. Um, this uh, is what in the scientific and technical communities we call natural law. Uh, 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 you can hire Larry Tribe even so you cannot repeal it. And the, fa <laughs> and the facts were these. Joan Berry, the mother, had group A blood. Carol Ann, the daughter, had group B blood. Charlie Chaplin's blood was group O. As three physicians testified at Chaplin's trial, to no avail whatsoever, uh, Chaplin was not, in fact, Carol Ann's father. Our liability system has long been characterized as a system of accountability, a system for making people more responsible uh, for what they do. Uh, we must never lose sight of the fact that this is the lawyer's very optimistic view of things. The only certain thing about liability in the courts is that responsibility, one way or another, will be moved around from somewhere to somewhere else. Uh, sometimes, without doubt, responsibility should be moved. I have no doubt whatsoever that uh, Wendy Gatch should have paid for running over Darlene Norris uh, in an Alaska parking lot. But if shifting responsibility is your interest and is your occupation, you really have to be scrupulously careful that you don't begin shifting it the wrong way and to the wrong places. Um, most lawyers are really quite ready to accept that engineers and doctors and druggists and airline pilots and, and, and other uh, Hollywood types and such sometimes mess up. Um, many of us have been almost equally ready to assume in years past um, that the legal system, with all its marvelously solemn and intricate uh, procedures doesn't uh, mess up. Uh, we have almost automatically assumed sometimes that uh, the legal system operates to correct wrongs, not to create them. Now, if you assume that other people screw up all the time, but you never do, you very quickly persuade yourself uh, that power and responsibility and control and anything else you care to be named, uh, care to name, should be shifted into your hands. Uh, that in inevitably means taking power and responsibility and control away from the marketplace, away from private contract, away from the consensus norms of the scientific community, away from just about everybody else. That is precisely what has been happening in our legal system in recent decades. The record has not been one of which uh, we as lawyers should be proud. Junk science has flourished in the courts. We have shifted vast sums of money and thus e uh, concomitantly uh, vast measures of responsibility on the strength of facts that aren't facts and science that isn't so. Uh, time and again, the law has played right into the hands of the professional victims in our midst, the kind of unhappy people who exist and prosper by blaming someone else for everything. The Charlie Chaplin story is still replayed almost daily in our courts today, not mostly in paternity cases, of course, but in cases seeking to blame cars and chemicals, vaccines and pesticides, obstetricians and employers for a scourge of tribulations and misfortunes that in fact all too frequently have causes much, much closer to home. Indeed, in a considerable number of cases, the causes, the real causes of life's afflictions and life's troubles lie directly within the ostensible victim's own control. I know full well that to say that is uncharitable. It is ungenerous. Outside this room, at least, it is politically incorrect. Nonetheless, it is still true. Um, the story is told of a Delaware inventor who comes uh, to the patent office here in Washington with a design for a perpetual motion machine. Now, the patent office has a firm policy that it always denies such patents because they violate either the first or the second law of thermodynamics. The disappointed inventor goes to his senator and complains that his marvelous device, which is surely going to solve all of our energy problems, 
has been uh, denied a, a patent. The senator calls uh, the patent commissioner and demands an immediate explanation. Uh, the commissioner explains, but senator, we, ne we never patent devices that violate the second law of thermodynamics. What, shouts the senator, who passed that law? I'm going to have it repealed. Uh, <laughs> let me hasten to add that so far as I know, no senator from Delaware has ever said any such thing. Uh, <laughs> Um, neither, so far as I know, uh, did Neil Kinnock. Uh, but it... Uh, but, in, but in light of what we've been hearing from the Senate and the court of this last week, I don't rule out the possibility for the future. We seem to live in an age today where it is stupid, irresponsible, unconscionable, reprehensible to believe in any constant, overarching, immutable principles. And yet, uh, such principles are really all around us. The second law of thermodynamics is just one of many. A great debate, as we all know today, is whether there can ever be the equivalent of a second law of thermodynamics in the much fuzzier realm of human law rather than the Almighty's. Do words have meaning or are they just silly putty? Do the words of the Constitution that uh, I believe establish my right not to be searched without a warrant somehow also establish my right to march into people's drugs, slap down $5, and demand a packet of Trojans. I submit that any of you who believe, as I do, in the possibility of objectively ascertainable law must believe, passionately believe, and affirm, and defend with equal conviction the existence of a coherent, rational, detectable, ascertainable body of scientific fact. The rule of law is a completely empty promise in the end if the facts all around us are infinitely plastic and manipulable to be bought and sold like expert witnesses, we will have won nothing at all if we resuscitate the rule of law in this country and yet continue to accept that key facts are as pliable and evanescent and changeable as the individual trial or the individual lawyer. In the end, our tolerance for junk science reflects on our morality itself. Uh, Marvin Harris makes this point in his classic book, uh, cows, Pigs, Wars, and Witches. Some of you will suppose that this is a book about the Senate Judiciary Committee. It, it, <laughs> uh, it, it isn't, um, though it does indeed concern ignorance, prejudice, bias, and superstition. Uh, <laughs> it, it is quite impossible, writes Harris, to subvert objective knowledge without subverting the basis of moral judgment. If we cannot know with reasonable certainty who did what, when, and where, we can scarcely hope to render a moral account of ourselves. We have to make up our minds about certain events. If we really have no confidence in our ability to determine facts, we must either advocate the total suspension of moral judgments or adopt the inquisitorial position and hold people responsible for what they do in each other's dreams. Dreams? Yes, indeed, dreams. Let us never forget the considerable social peril of acting on the basis of dreams. Here is the Cecil Parkinson story one last time, as told on December 21st in the year 1601. On that day, Elsie Gwinner, the baker's wife, is burned to death in Offenburg, Germany, for having had intercourse with the devil. Between the Renaissance and the Reformation, in fact, 500,000 women, mostly in Europe, suffered similar fates on the strength of similar charges. But Elsie Gwinner, I firmly believe, did not in fact have intercourse with the devil. As Harris reminds us, that is not an uninteresting or uncertain conclusion, uh, considering the fact that she was carbonized for having done it. Well, as Voltaire once said, uh, once for experience, twice a pervert. I suppose Mr. Cecil Parkinson has uh, learned similar lessons. Uh, many of the grand legal experiments of the last decade were well-intentioned. Uh, many of them have proved to be flamboyant failures. We have had our decade or two of experience with uh, many of these uh, experiments. Uh, another decade or two would have to be called perversion. Uh, I believe in individual responsibility. So do we all. So I am quite sure do many people who would disagree with everything else that we believe in. The key in this debate is not the grand principle, which everybody will affirm. It is rather in the details. The details, I believe, revolve around familiar but in our time, sadly dilapidated legal norms. 
Without doubt, individual responsibility is possible only when we are held to account for harms we do to other, others without their consent. Of course, we need a well-defined, healthy law of tort. Uh, but individual responsibility is also possible only when the individual is empowered to make binding choices, to keep his distance from the government if he chooses, and of course, the government includes the courts. This requires an even stronger and better defined, healthier law of contract. Uh, finally, uh, across the board, courts can vindicate individual responsibility only if they maintain, scrupulously maintain, rules and procedures for deciding facts reliably and consistently. It is precisely when the facts are uncertain, as they always will be in some measure. It is precisely when we feel that we are ignorant of the absolute truth. It is precisely in those circumstances that we most need very caref carefully crafted, very accurate, very reliable, predictable procedures for deciding what is and what isn't. In the end, I firmly believe it is only such rules and only such procedures that stand between Elsie Gwinner and indeed every one of us and the bonfire. Thank you very much. We have time for a quick question or two, if there, if there are any. Sir? Yes. No. Well, it, it, was, it was a failure to, the, of course, uh, embracing junk science is having Charlie Chaplin parade and have the jury look at the, a child. It was a failure. It was an absolute failure of science. I agree. That's that. That's correct. That's correct. They should. Have. I agree. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Uh, I've written a book on the subject. <laughs> um, uh, let me say that that to give a full answer, I would have to descend into the equivalent of you know mechanics liens in Kentucky. Uh, uh, but but I I will say this: there there is a single principle that I think we have to resurrect, and that is the principle of holding lawyers in their profession and in what they do to the same standards as we hold litigants and defendants. Uh, it is unconscionable that self-styled professionals can perform on the witness stand today in, in ways which, if taken to the clinic or the laboratory or anywhere else, would be actionable negligence or malpractice, okay? It, we, we simply need to reaffirm the principle that the same standards we attempt to impose on defendants, we oppose, or, or, or plaintiffs for that matter, we oppose, impose on their accusers. It's, a, it's an important symmetry, and I've, I could write 100 pages on it and have indeed done so. <laughs> all right, thank you for, again, Dr. Huber, and thank you all. We'll reconvene in 15 minutes. <laughs>